Okay, now I want to look at some properties that function can have. Um, the first one is a function is called one-to-one -one if it never takes the same value twice. So a nice way to visualize this is in terms of our, you know, our function diagram here. Here's our function. We've got our set of inputs over here, our set of outputs. The function takes inputs to outputs. It's one-to-one -one if it doesn't take the same value twice. What that means is, suppose I start with some inputs over here, then those all have to go to different outputs. This is an example of a one-to-one -one function, which we typically write as one dash one. What would a, a function that's not one-to-one -one look like? Well, it would have to have the property that it took the same value on twice. So there would have to be a couple of different inputs. So maybe this one, this one goes over here. But there would have to be a couple of different inputs which ended up going to the same place. So this would be an example of a function that's not one-to-one. -one. Let's just get the name in there. So that was f. So a, a function that's not one-to-one -one has two different inputs that get sent to the same place. A function that is one-to-one, -one, every input gets sent to a different place than every other input. So this is typically written as if the inputs are different, x1 and x2 are different, then the values that get sent out of the function, the function values, must be different. There's an alternate way to write this, which is equivalent. So Alternatively, we could say that a function is one-to-one -one if the outputs were the same, if f, one, if f of x1 is the same as f of x2, then the inputs had to be the same. x1 would have had to have been equal to x2. It's an equivalent statement to the one above. These are equivalent statements. Um, you may see either one of them written when you look at descriptions of one-to-one -one functions. Um, so, when we're asked to show a function is one-to-one -one or show a function is not one-to-one, -one, how do we actually do that? What, what's the process? So to show f is not one-to-one, -one, we need to just find two input values, so two inputs, let's say x1 and x2, so that they are different, but the values of the function are the same. So we just need to find two inputs. One example, one example we need. We just need an example of finding two input values, x1 and x2, which are different, so that the function values are the same. On the other hand, to show f is one to one, we need to show that for every x1 not equal to x2, f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. We need to show that for every two inputs that are different, the outputs are different. So we need a much more general argument to show a function is one to one. To show it's not one-to-one, -one, we just need an example of a couple of inputs. So let's look at some examples here. Which of the following functions are one-to-one? -one? Now, so I'm, I'm being a little bit brisk here because this is a review and you've seen these things already. Um, I'm going to rely on your knowledge of some of the graphs of these things just to, just to see. So the first one, f of x equals x squared. It's a parabola. looks like this. Is it one-to-one -one or not? Well, no, it's not one-to-one -one because, for example, f of negative one is equal to f of one. So those are two inputs, one and negative one, and yet they give rise to the same output, namely the value of one. What about g of x equal to x cubed? Is that one-to-one -one or not? Well, a cubic function looks like this. 
And so for every input seems to give rise to a unique output. So it is one to one. It is one to one. How about h of x equals the exponential function of base e? That function looks like this. And again, it is one to one. The exponential function of base e is one to one. Each input gives rise to a unique output. In fact, the, as you take the inputs bigger and bigger and bigger, the function values are bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is an example of an increasing function. As the inputs increase in size, the outputs have to increase in size as well. Um, D, i of x is sine of x. Is that function one to one or not? Well, the sine function oscillates. So it looks like this. And it just keeps continuing. Well, no, it can't be one to one. For example, it takes on the value zero a bunch of times when the input is zero, when the input is pi, when the input is two pi. So sine of zero is the same as sine of pi. So two different inputs give rise to the same output. The output is zero in this case. So it's not one to one. What about this last example? The sine function again, but now we're restricting the domain. Negative pi by two to pi by two. The restricted sine function. In this case, our function looks like this. So that's pi by two, that's negative pi by two. The range goes from negative one to one. Is that function one to one? Well, now it is. Now it is, since I've eliminated all the possible repeating values that the function can take. It only takes the values between negative one and one, and it takes each one of them exactly once over the interval from negative pi by two to pi by two. So this is one to one. So we could take a function that's not one to one and restrict its domain so that now it is one to one. So here's a restricted sine function, which is now one to one on its domain. Now you may recall a test known as the horizontal line test, which given the graph of a function, you can determine whether it's one to one or not just by staring at the graph. And so for example, maybe this is our function. Is it one to one or not? Well, what we do is we draw horizontal lines everywhere. And if we can find a place where when we draw the horizontal line, it hits the graph in more than one spot. In this case, it's hitting it at three places. Then we know it's not one to one, since, for example, if the function was f in this case, f of a would be the same as f of b, which would be the same as f of c, because they are all of the same height. And so it's definitely not one to one. So a function is one to one if and only if no horizontal line intersects the graph more than once. So if a horizontal line does intersect it more than once, it's not one to one. So why are we interested in one to one functions? Well, the key point is, is if we have a function that's one to one, we can create a new function from it. So suppose I have a function that's one to one and it's got a domain of A, codomain B, mapping in this direction, and it's one-to-one. -one. What does it mean to be one-to-one -one again? Pictorially, it means that we've got, for all, our, all these inputs here, they go to different outputs. So here's our outputs. Now, we could, in some sense, look at a new function which has domain B and codomain A. How do we obtain this function? We just reverse the arrows. So we go back along each arrow. That's what we're going to define the inverse function to be, which we denote f with a superscript of negative one. So the inverse function we get by just going and reversing all these arrows. So maybe I should have written f in red here, because it's following the arrows in this direction.
And the inverse function just does the opposite, maps everything back. We needed f to be 1 to 1 in order to make sense of this um, ability to take the arrows backwards. So if f is not 1 to 1, then we get a picture that looks something like this. We get f here, we get these two values that go to the same place. If I wanted to try to reverse these arrows, I run into issues. Because I start with this point over here and I want to figure out what should I get mapped to? If I'm going to define an inverse function of this, what should I get mapped to? Well, I've got two possibilities. I can either go to that one or that one. But a function has to take an input to a unique output. We can't take one input to two different outputs. That's not a function. So reversing the arrows does not result in a function. So if f was not one-to-one -to, -one to begin with, then we can't play this game of reversing the arrows to construct a new function. We won't get a function that way. If f is one-to-one, -one, we can reverse all the arrows and get a new function called the inverse. So that's what the inverse function is defined to be. That's pictorially. Um, here I've written out the definition as follows. It's the function defined by, well, f inverse of y is x, precisely when f of x is y. So if we just jot down x and y in our diagram below, we'll see why that makes sense. So if f of x goes to y, then f inverse of y, following the arrow in the other direction, goes to x. So there's this game of if x goes to y under f, then y goes to x under f inverse. So here we can just note a few things. Note that if I start with x over here and I apply f to it, then I land over here in the set b, then I can apply f inverse to it, and what do I land at? Well, if I start at x and I do this game, I first apply f, I land over here, now, to that value, I now apply f inverse. Where do I land back at? I land back at x. So this is x. So the inverse function and the function itself has the property that if you compose them, you just get the identity, the identity function. You can do that in the other way as well. If I start with y over here, and I apply f inverse to it, and then I land over here at x, and then I apply f to that, then I just come back to y again. So those are the properties that the inverse function and the function itself has. That if you compose one with the other, then they just undo each other and you get the identity, the identity function. f of f inverse of y is y, and f inverse of f of x is just x. They undo each other. And that's the important part about these inverse functions, is we're going to like to try to undo a function at some point, and we are going to use this inverse function to do that. So let's have a look at finding the formula for an inverse. So this is, this is definitely review, but let's just see how, how we do this. Um, so I want to find the inverse function of f. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a variable for f, call it y. That's the output variable of our function. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to now solve this equation for x in terms of y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by denominator here. And now I'm going to expand the left hand side. It's 3xy plus y is equal to x. I'm trying to isolate x on one side of the equation, so I'm going to move everything involving x to one side and everything involving y to the other side. I can now factor out an x And now I can isolate the x by dividing both sides by 3y minus 1. And so therefore, the inverse function is negative y over 3y minus 1. And I encourage you to check this. Check that if you take f composed with f inverse of y, you get y. And also check that 
if you compose them in the other direction. So check this. You can always do a check. Once you find the inverse, you can always check it's the inverse just by doing the composition and making sure you get the identity out.